Good morning. Uh, welcome to Trinity, and happy Father's Day. <clears throat> uh, take a moment to welcome those around you, especially people you don't know, and uh, do the passing of the peace. Uh, if you have your bulletin, take that out for a minute and uh, look at the announcements. And there's also a registration form in there. Uh, if you could take a moment, tear it out, fill it out, and uh, put it in the offering plate later, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> the World Changers are here with us this week. Um, they'll, you know, they're in worship with us, and we'll be feeding them lunch every day at their job site. So welcome. Make sure to come say hi to them after the service. Um, for the kids, movie Mon- movie Mondays start this week. Um, see the announcement. And this Wednesday is the first Wednesday of the Tag Your It series for pre-K and children. <clears throat> uh, the youth leave for Passport next Sunday, so be, uh, be praying for us as uh, we get ready to go. <clears throat> uh, Amy wanted me to let you know that it was a great week of VBS. I think it went well. It was fun. And um, there's no college Bible study tonight because of, er, of Father's Day. <clears throat> so I was thinking about Father's Day and... Um, you know, we hear the phrase God the Father so much that um, I don't think we really realize what, like, a big deal that is, what a shocking claim it is. Like, Jesus came to earth claiming that God was his Father, and that was bold, and that's why he got killed for it. Um, even more bold, he claimed that we have been adopted into that family, and that God also is our Father. So now, today, and as you go from here, think about that. In Christ, God is your Father. Welcome to worship.
Thank you, Lauren. Please bow with me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be able to come before you in prayer. Fill our hearts with adoration and love as we contemplate what a privilege that is. Today, we'd like to take the time to thank you for our fathers. Thank you for the natural and spiritual fathers and the mentors who stood in when our fathers couldn't. Thank you for their nurture and careful guidance. Thank you for the ones who put a value on effort, motivation, and excellence. Thank you for the ones who lived a life that held you in high esteem. And thank you for the ones who at moments may not have been the best example of fatherhood, thus allowing us to lean on you all the more. You, dear God, are the best father we could ever imagine. Thank you for knowing our needs before we even do. Thank you for your guidance, your wisdom, and even your discipline. We yield our hearts to you this day and ask you teach us in the ways of righteousness. We also ask your special blessing this week on the world changers that are here. Thank you for each one who has been led by the Spirit to serve as Christ served. Enrich them, keep them safe, and strengthen them as they are messengers of the good news. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Let us now sing together our hymn of invocation, hymn number 244, Spirit of the Living God. Please stand together as we sing. I thought Yvonne's prayer was just beautiful. Thank you for the prayer you offered this morning. And she did mention the fact that today is Father's Day, and I'd like for us to recognize the men of our church for the many reasons that uh, we as a church would want to recognize individuals who choose to allow Christ to work through them. I want to say that we have some little gifts that we want to give you, and we're going to invite the children to come up here in just a second, and youth, y'all can help us as we pass out. We're going to give lifesavers. The ladies got flowers. The guys are getting lifesavers. <laughs> I can't promise you the lifesavers will make it from the children to you, but that's what we have for you. Uh, we recognize the men who are fathers and the other men who are spiritual fathers to our church, and I think Yvonne said it very well. All of us can count several men in our lives who provided Christian mentorship and guidance to us, and in this church, I've already seen so well how many of you teach and serve and provide good examples that we need to see in you. So I invite now all our men to stand. If you would, remain standing until you get some lifesavers, or at least someone heads your way. And children, would you come and youth? We have baskets here for lifesavers to give them. And when you get your lifesavers, would you just have a seat? That'd be great. All right. There you go. You can help over here. They probably need some help. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. I got some. Thanks. You see how this works? <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> all right. Thank you all very much. I'm still standing and I've gotten three already. <laughs> I like this tradition, don't y'all? <laughs> this is great. Um, appreciate the children and the youth helping to do that, and we did want to honor you. I'd like to say just a word of prayer for us today, too. Let's bow as we pray. Our God, we are grateful for the men in our lives that you have used, who have allowed you to work through them to touch us and love us and take care of us. We pray your blessings on them as these men continue to stand for Christ in our world today. Watch over them and keep them in your care always. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning's scripture lesson is from Galatians chapter 5, verses 15 through 26. If you are the sort who is already eagerly uh, put your finger in that spot in your Bible to follow along as I'm reading. Please move over a few pages to chapter 5 rather than chapter 2. Galatians 5, 15 through 26. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you're not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. At this time, our pre-K and kindergartners are invited to exit for children's worship as we sing together our hymn of service, hymn number 604, Come All Christians Be Committed. Please stand together as we sing.
And now I ask that you join me in a moment of stillness and silence as we seek to hear from our Lord. Almighty God, we come before you in this quiet moment. We breathe in and we breathe out, and we see things more clearly. We bring our worries and our cares to you, God. We bring our thanksgiving and our praise to you as well. Thank you for meeting us here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
was a beautiful hymn. I liked the, the, what you sang today, and it sort of sounded like a prayer a preacher would, pre would pray before they got up to, to preach. Thank you for that. Uh, before I begin, I wanted to uh, recognize Christine. Uh, Christine Evans has been a part of this church for a long time, and this is her last Sunday with us. She'll be moving, I think, to Houston, Texas, in that area. Uh, our, we'll be praying for you, and this is always going to be your home church, but we bless you in this part of the journey of your life. And if you get a chance today after church, just go by and give her a hug and pat her on the back and let her know you'll be thinking of her and praying for her. Okay? Also, we're glad that our World Changers group uh, is here. We have a group from uh, Columbia, Tennessee, I think, and Franklin, North Carolina. We're glad you're here, and our Associate Director of Missions, Ron Lynch, is, is with them as well. Thank you all for your service in the Huntsville, Madison area. Uh, this uh, week, and I hope you'll have a great experience. Don't get too hot out there. And our folks will be feeding you lunch this week as well. And then our youth, just to uh, remind you, our youth will be leaving for Passport Youth Camp next Sunday morning early at 7 o'clock. The bus will be loading, and Teresa said departing at 7.15, I think. So uh, please pray for our youth. They'll be gone next Sunday. They'll be gone all week to Macon, Georgia at Mercer University and be serving in missions opportunities around that area as well as uh, worship and been able to connect with a lot of other youth. Um, I, I want to just mention that uh, I had a great time at Vacation Bible School this week. This is one of the things I really look forward to the most uh, as a pastor. It's one of the fun things we do. We have a lot of kids that come up here. So many of you helped providing your gifts and your offerings and your time and your talents to make this just a wonderful Bible School experience. We had the experience of going to Athens sort of uh, as the, the context for the uh, journey of Bible school, and it was pretty neat to do all that. Amy asked me to play the part of Paul, and I was really flattered by that. I was excited to be able to play the part of Paul, and Dionysius, a.k.a. Steve Horn, was my sidekick, and Kim Rehage took care of all of us in that room, taking care of all the arrangements for us, and I got to meet all the children every night as they came through, tell them the stories about Paul and all that kind of stuff, and, and I'll tell you, I really was flattered when Amy asked me to play the part of Paul, because he was such an important and pivotal Christian figure in our heritage, and he wrote much of the New Testament. And I was expecting and got the kids to have such a good response to Paul during this week. You know, they were high-fiving Paul in the hallways, and when they were leaving, see you, Paul, glad to see you. And it was exciting for me uh, to do that. One girl goes to another church, and she was at our Bible school, and she said, we're doing Bible school next week at our church, and we're also studying about Paul. Would you come and play the part of Paul at our church? I said, well, somebody needs to call me. I don't know if I should do that. And then I remembered what they said about Paul. He wasn't much to look at. <laughs> years and years after his death, there was a, an apocryphal book written called The Acts of Paul, and it describes him this way. Ball-headed, <laughs> bow-legged, strongly built, a man small in size, with meeting eyebrows, with a rather large nose. And in the book of Corinthians, Paul actually quotes somebody who really saw him back in those days as saying, his letters are strong, but his bodily presence is weak. <laughs> Later on in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, Five times I've received at the hands of the Jews, the forty lashes less one. Three times I've been beaten with rods, once I was stoned, three times shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been adrift at sea, in danger from rivers, robbers, my own people, Gentiles, in toil and hardship, hunger and thirst, and cold and exposure. He was also sick a good bit of the time that he was even doing this missionary work that he did. He talked about a thorn in the flesh. We're still not sure what that was that he said God had given him so he wouldn't be too elated. Sound like a pretty elated life, right? And then one of my favorite commentators says this, the wonder of it is that he was able to get around it all. Amy, thank you for thinking of me to play the, <laughs> the part of Paul in Vacation Bible School this week. That means a lot to me. Today is Father's Day, and I think you probably could expect that any minister would say to men in particular, but for all of us, but to men in particular, that we need you to be good role models for Christ and for the cause of Christ in this world today. I want to thank you for striving to be those kinds of things, for being in church, for being a godly man. But as I thought about that today, as I ask you to do that, I'd ask myself to do that, 
who are the people you look to? Who are your role models? Who are the people that you look up to that can maybe impact the kind of man or woman that you're going to be? And I want to suggest Paul to you, despite everything that I just said about Paul. We are called, each of us, men and women, boy and girl, to be witnesses for Christ in our world, in our homes, in our place of employment, in places of recreation. If you get an opportunity to coach, you have a great chance to influence people in many ways. I want to commend Paul to you as an example, as a role model. And here are some reasons that I want to do that. Dionysius, Steve Horn, in the little skits that we were doing during this week, came to me one point and said, came to Paul and said, Paul, you need to quit talking about Jesus here in Athens because it's dangerous for you. And in the little skit, Paul, I am supposed to respond by saying, laughing at Dionysius and saying, I'm not going to stop. I love Jesus and I want people to know about Jesus. So I've had all kinds of bad things happen to me because of that, but it's not going to stop me. Well, Paul did have a lot of bad things happen to him because he was so courageous. And it's one of the things I admire about Paul. He had a lot of courage, the courage of his convictions. Now, if you're looking for somebody that's politically correct, you wouldn't go to Paul. Paul would write very frankly to all these churches that he cared a lot about, to people who asked him questions about how the church should act. These were brand new churches. There had never been anything like this before. So folks in all these little towns where he had shared Christ and churches had formed were, were getting word back to him about what do we do about this situation when it happens in church. And he wrote back in letters to many of them and sent word to them in other ways. And he was very frank with them when he did that. He didn't shy away from these issues and these topics. And I think in a way he thought of his churches as children. And he loved his children. He admired his children. But he also was willing to chide his children as well. But he had the courage to speak up, speak his mind about what he believed and what he believed to be true. Now, you remember the story of Jesus being arrested and taken before the Roman leader Pontius Pilate. In one of those scenes in the Gospel of John, Jesus says to him, the people who know the truth and belong to the truth, they get me. Basically, that's what he said. And Pilate has this very famous response. And he says to Jesus, what is truth? I've always imagined that scene in, in that Roman Praetorium area where he was taken and captured and being interviewed by Pilate, is Pilate not even looking at Jesus, but just sort of gazing off and asking that question almost rhetorically to himself. What is truth? I think that we struggle with that a little bit today in our world. Our founding documents talk about truth, don't they? At some point in time, our founding fathers and mothers understood some things were true, and they would be true forever. We hold these truths to be self-evident, they said. The pursuit of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness, all those kinds of things. Those things were bestowed on all of humanity by nature and nature's God, they said. But we live in a different time, not even a modern time. Some people call it a postmodern time and now even another time. A time of great change and upheaval in the world where everything is very relative. We have moved so many people to Pilate's camp now. People who will say, what is truth? What is true? What is truth that will always be true? One of my favorite preachers of all time is a guy named Fred Craddock. For years and years he has preached at a little church in North Georgia called Cherry Log Church. He's also been the distinguished professor of preaching at Emory University. He's a guy of small stature and bald-headed. He may be bow-legged. I think he only has two eyebrows, though. But he's a great preacher. His sermons appeal to the common human experience. He talks about a story, maybe, that we all can relate to, no matter what our backgrounds are. The critique on him and his preaching is that because everything is relative, there is no such thing as a common human experience. You can't understand things in life that you don't live through yourself because of your race or your gender or your ethnicity or your language or your background or all these kinds of things. Today, I think we're afraid because of the relativity of everything. Because of Pilate's camp being such a large camp now, what is true? We're afraid to speak up often about what we believe to be true especially as it relates to our faith in Christ. 
In the Bible school, there was a moment where Paul, where I have the opportunity for all these groups of kids to come and ask them several questions. One of the questions I ask is, have you ever been made to feel unpopular because you wanted to speak about Jesus or you wanted to say something or have some kind of evidence of you being a church member? You go to church or you're a Christian. Now, when the little preschoolers were in there, they didn't get that at all. We had to really tailor it differently because I don't think any of the preschoolers have ever felt unpopular about anything. They're wonderful. But the older kids, they all got it. They all understood that question. They understood what it meant for somebody to say, have you ever felt unpopular because you chose to speak about Jesus? You chose to display your faith in some way. I think adults, we all get that too, don't we? Don't we understand that? Christ is treated in our time as just one more item on this big buffet. You go to a cafeteria and there's all kinds of food there that you can choose from. And in this cafeteria of the world we live in today, there's all kinds of philosophies and religions and thoughts that you can tr choose from. And Christ is one of those. In Athens, we learned that in Athens there was a place where all these statues were, were that represented all kinds of gods of the world. There was even a statue to the unknown God. Paul appealed to that and said that might be the true God, true God, the God of our Father, the God of Jesus. I think about this old commercial that I heard many years ago, I think it's for Wendy's, that said, where's the beef? Y'all remember that? That's my question, too. With all the stuff we're offered today and all the choices, what is true? What is true for you? What are the things you're willing to be courageous about in your life? If there's so many choices and everything's relative, then the question for a lot of people is, why bother with anything at all? Paul had the courage to have some convictions and to stand up for his convictions. And I think he's a model for men and women Boys and girls today. Some of you might have seen the Super Bowl, this last Super Bowl, the Super Bowl commercial that was entitled God Created a Farmer. Did anybody see that one? There was a commercial and it was about these farmers and so forth and they had all this stuff going on with farming life and then a little guy was saying in there, it sounded like a Paul Harvey guy or something saying and God created a farmer. Well, there was an Air Force chaplain recently that rewrote that poem and said, God created a drill sergeant. Now, I thought about that and I thought, I don't know, some people are going to say, I don't know about the drill sergeants, but maybe. And he wrote the poem, God created a drill sergeant. And then at his base, they created a video from that and wanted to show that, but the Pentagon issued orders for them not to show that video because it was talking too much about God. And it may be offensive to those who do not believe in God. I'm not going to get into the merits of why we should or shouldn't do those things, but it's interesting also in April of this year, that was in June, in April of this year, a Medal of Honor was awarded to a Korean War veteran who had passed on, died in Korea during the war, who was a chaplain. And this chaplain, who was so beloved by the soldiers he served, was honored because, I believe, his faith dictated the way he chose to be courageous. One of the famous pictures of this chaplain is him having a jeep pulled up in the front areas of warfare and having a makeshift altar, a communion altar, on the hood of the jeep. Of course, we live in another time, don't we? Paul had the courage of his convictions. He got in trouble for it, but it wouldn't stop him. And I admire him for it. I think he's a role model for all of us who would be Christian in our world today. I want to be clear about this. His convictions were very focused. You know, we get out of focus a lot. And we think those are convictions that are central to our faith. And sometimes they're not. If you tell somebody you're a Baptist, a lot of them today already know what you believe. They know what you think. They think you're judgmental, probably. They think you're a certain way. I remember years ago, we would always go to the mountains and camp, all four of the boys and Mary, and we'd pile in our Suburban. We had uh, bikes tied on the back, some on the top. We had coolers. It looked like the Clampets, wherever we went. <laughs> we camped everywhere, too, in tents. It was wild. I remember we stopped one time near Maryville, Tennessee, on our way up there to get, stop at a Kroger to get some groceries and some supplies. 
and we were barefooted and we were ready for the campground and we got out and we went inside and somehow we got in a conversation with somebody and they talked to Mary and it came up that I was a pastor and she said, oh, you're a pastor's wife and you got all these kids. I guess you homeschool your kids, don't you? Because they know what we think. And here's Mary who has been a public school teacher all her life and has treasured that aspect of her identity and her calling to do that. Again, the merits of homeschooling or public school is not what I'm talking about. I am saying to you that sometimes we as Baptist Christians have gotten off track because we talk about this issue and that issue, and they may be important for you. Paul was focused in his convictions. He said simply, I preach Christ and Him crucified and Him raised by God to eternal life. The early Christians would say, we can recognize another believer in Jesus by three words. If they can say to us, Jesus is Lord, we know they're with us. I know that's very naive, isn't it? Because anybody could say Jesus is Lord and doesn't, doesn't mean that. We, can, we know that because we're very intelligent and smart. We know that people can trick us. But these early Christians were naive. They were naive in their sharing of their things with each other in their churches. They were naive in their sharing of Jesus and their faith wherever they were run off to or wherever they lived in their neighborhoods. They were naive in their thinking that Jesus could, the Spirit could implant in you the idea that Jesus is your Lord. And you could confess that to a fellow believer and both of you would recognize the genuineness of your witness and your confession. They were naive enough to believe in the immediacy and the expectation that Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit could indwell their lives and their churches. It's a simple thought and it's a simple question for us today. Do we believe? Do we have the courage of a focused conviction? Simply put, is Jesus our Lord? I preach Jesus, Paul said, and Him crucified and Him raised to life. One person I heard many years ago said, every man and woman has one great song in them. For me, probably not a great song, maybe one great sermon in them. One great message of your life. I want to ask you, men and women, what is the great message of your life? the focused conviction of what you stand for. I also like his passion. Paul was a very passionate guy. In Bible school, there's a place where I get to say as Paul, I don't care what they'll do to me, but if I had the opportunity, I'd stand on the rooftops and I'd shout out about my conviction that Jesus is Lord. When I was preaching in the Dominican Republic, I felt very alive on that Wednesday dedication service. The place was really rocking. It was a different cultural experience, but I loved it. A wonderful experience as I preached and Jonathan, our interpreter, was interpreting. And, and I watched and one of the things that I noticed was one of our local interpreters who I thought had been, was a very quiet young lady throughout the week. I watched her while I'm preaching and throughout the worship service. She's standing on her feet and she's shouting, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Some of them said, Hallelujah! And she had her cell phone and all she's taking pictures or recording it or whatever she was doing. Or, but it was an amazing experience of being alive in worship. You see that passion, don't you? You've seen that passion in politics. You see it at sporting events. You've seen it in relationships for good or bad. Where do we see that passion in our faith? I think you ought to read the letters of Paul. But maybe better, have someone read the letters to you. Paul's letters were meant to be heard as much as read. I think maybe the thorn in his flesh might have been his eyesight. A lot of folks said he had bad eyesight. In fact, there's one place where at the end of his letter he says, Look, I'm signing this myself and look what big letters I use. Maybe because his eyesight was so poor. And maybe because of that, instead of him writing the letters out, he dictated the letters out. Now imagine trying to keep up with Paul as he's dictating these letters with all his passion and his energy, chiding and loving these churches. He preached those letters. He shouted out those letters. He wept out those letters. He laughed out those letters. These were spirit-inspired utterances of God through the Apostle Paul in those letters. And I admire his passion as a believer in Jesus. On his first missionary journey, he took a young guy with him named John Mark. And John Mark along the way got homesick. 
and ran away. On the second journey, John Mark says, I'm ready to sign up again. And Paul says, nope, you're not going. You run away, homesick boy. And Barnabas, his good friend, said, I believe we need to give John Mark another chance. And Paul wouldn't do it. So Barnabas and John Mark go off and God uses an avenue of preaching and witnessing and missionary work. And Paul connects with Silas and another young guy, Timothy. Now, I think that John Mark, because there's places in there where they talk again in the Bible, they connect back up and reconcile. John Mark goes on to write the first gospel we have, the gospel according to Mark. But all that's to say that Paul was a passionate guy. He feel, He felt about things. He was alive. He said once, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. So in one breath, the passage that Hal read for us earlier, in one breath, he's condemning all these negative sinful things that people in the church sometimes do. And he says to him, I tell you, if you do any of those kinds of things on my list, you have no part in the kingdom of heaven. It's a lot of passion, isn't it? And in the next breath, he shares this beautiful, lovely gifts of the Holy Spirit for us, the fruit of the Spirit, like gentleness and kindness and self-control. He bit down hard on those people who tried to hinder the work of the Holy Spirit in the world. But he also wrote some of the most passionate and beautiful and most meaningful passages of our New Testament, like this. You can have a peace that can surpass all understanding through your faith in Jesus Christ. Press on. Keep pressing on toward the goal of the high calling that God has given to each of you in this world. When you don't know how to pray, remember that the Holy Spirit is within you and it groans on your behalf to our Heavenly Father. With God, there is no such thing as partiality. We are all one. Male, female, Greek, Jew, slave and free. And then he said, I'm convinced that there's nothing in all of this world, in heaven, nothing that can ever separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ. Today, I'm simply appealing to you to think about your role models, and I'm commending Paul to you and to me, just as I ask each of us to do our best to be role models in our communities and in our families. And if you're worried that you can't do it, remember Paul once said, there are times when I'm weak, I even do the things I don't want to do, and it aggravates me. I'm sure he dictated that out very loudly. But he also said, when I'm weak, I've found that God is glorified. God becomes strong in me so that I can say to you boldly, when I'm weak, I'm also strong. May the faith be strong in you. Amy, thank you for asking me to play the part of Paul. It was an honor. Amen. Hello, I'm Mike Oliver. I'm the senior pastor here at Trinity Baptist Church. I'd like to thank you for joining us for worship through our church website. And also, I'd like to invite you to come and visit us. This is a great church. We have friendly people here. We value worship, we value community and global missions, and their programs for children all the way to senior adults. I think you'll like our church, and I hope you'll come and visit us and see for yourself in person. If you have questions about our church, like to know more, we'd love for you to contact us. There's information on our website. You can call us or email us or come by, and one of our staff members will be glad to talk with you. Welcome to Trinity, and God bless you and keep you.